Amen. Come on, come on. Give it up for Pastor Luke. Man, how awesome was that? When I was watching that video in the first service, I, I just really felt, I just got like a word from the Lord, and it just brought me back to just one, how, how incredible this country we live in is, because this is the only country that has the words in the Constitution, we the people. It's the only country that was ever founded upon the Word of God. And America is the only country that gives away more food than it eats. We're the only nation in history that is able to give away what we need, but we give away more of it to other people. And it's because we are founded on the Word of God. Can I get a quick amen this morning? Man. What an honor it is to be in this house of God to preach on this stage. What an honor it is to have my dad's hero, Pastor Tommy Barnett, in the front row. Man. Being the hero of my hero means he's a double hero. And the beautiful Maria, one of my dad's favorite people. Please give it up for Pastor Maria. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. And before I begin, how good was that praise and worship this morning? Anybody think that was incredible? Man, whenever I hear lion... I just, I, I want to fight someone. It's very, it's very interesting for Jesus. Go on a crusade. You know how it is. See, we are in our revolutionary church series. A series where we as a church are understanding what it truly means to be revolutionary. And not just relevant, which it's not a bad thing to be relevant. It's not a bad thing to be able to, to talk the, the common points of today's language. But relevance ends where revolution begins. Re relevance talks about issues, and revolution seeks to address those issues. A relevant church talks about the horrors of abortion. A revolutionary church goes out and begins to help pregnant mothers have a safe and effective way to bring the baby to life. A relevant church talks about giving once a month and, and sometimes once a year, depending on where you go. But a revolutionary church constantly shows people the life that God has for those who give and what it does to the community around them. See, a relevant church gives you a TED Talk on life. A relevant church gives you a little sermonette. But a revolutionary church gives you the power and authority of the Holy Spirit to be able to thrive in this life. I've got to tell us all this morning, it's not enough these days to be relevant but we've got to be revolutionary. So can I please have everybody just bow their heads and close their eyes with me as we go into service. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the word you've given me. Father, I pray that as my mouth opens up, let it be your word that comes out. Your word with the power to bring life. Your word with the power to bring a new beginning. The power to bring a healing. Holy Spirit, I pray that as my word comes out, you will uh, act on this word to perform it. Holy Spirit, I pray that everybody in these seats can receive your word in their hearts and act upon it. In Jesus, everybody said. Amen. Or as the youth like to say these days, a mizzle, a mizzle. That's what the youth be saying. That's what they be saying. I got to think, one of the funniest creatures on earth, if I'm being honest, I like animals. I have a son at home. His name's Archibald. He's this big and he's a runt. I call him a little runt. He's a cute kid. I love animals. One of the funniest creatures has to be an ostrich, right? Because it looks really ugly and it's the fastest two-legged animal on earth. When I first read this fact, I was like, what are you talking about? The cheetah's the fastest. The cheetah is the fastest four-legged, the ostrich is the fastest two-legged. But what really made me laugh when I was reading about the ostrich was there's this myth that when an ostrich would get scared, it would bury its head in the sand. Like, I don't want to deal with this anymore, Pop! and just plop itself in like a turnip. And they said that that was a way for them to ward off predators. But I'm like, if I was like a lion and I saw an ostrich just chilling there with its head in the ground, I'm like, this is a free meal. This is like, this is like takeout right here. Who ordered the Uber Eats? But, you know... It's like, just funny. Ostriches are funny. But ostriches don't actually do that. I was actually sad to, to learn that they don't actually do that. But it's commonly used figure of speech that when things get tough, people just bury their heads wherever and whenever they can. They don't want to have to face the issues or have to look at the earth anymore, so they keep their heads buried. See, a big lie told to all humanity, all of us, is that is this one, it's called ignorance is bliss. I'm sure I've heard, some of you have heard the phrase ignorance is bliss before. That the less you know, the less there is to get angry or be afraid of. That when Aubrey tells me there's a new sale at Nordstrom's, I'm like, babe, I don't wanna know. Just don't even tell me. Just, just take the wallet and leave, right? See, now ignorance might make one's life simpler. Absolutely, ignorance makes one's life simpler, but ignorance is not bliss, ignorance is death. That the less we know doesn't actually benefit us, it cripples us. See, yes, when your eyes are open, it might make it harder. It might make it tougher. You can no longer do, no longer in good conscience, do certain things anymore. But when your eyes are opened, you'll be actually able to see what we need to get done and what God has in store for us. You see, you can never fix what you don't see. 
You can never fix in this world what you don't see. You can never take out the enemy that you don't see. There's a reason why crime goes up at night. There's a reason why sin, Jesus says, always operates under a cover of darkness. The devil himself hides the way he's seen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, that he wears a mask to look like an angel of light. Because the devil knows if he's seen for what he truly is, then no one would want to listen to him, right? That in order for him to sell us lies, he has to hide who he really is so we don't see it coming. That we cannot fix and take out an enemy that we don't see. You see, uh, one of the funny things that we as humanity have started doing is started blaming the devil for everything. It's like, the devil made me do it, right? We've heard that phrase. And I just kind of have this like picture in my head of that person who's trying to go on a diet, but they see the chocolate cake across the hall. And they always teach, it's not the first look that kills you, but the second. They look once, oh, that's chocolate cake. They look back. They look back, they do, and you know, no shame. I'm a fat guy at heart, but the fat guy move is they stroke their chin. Like, wow, that chocolate cake looks good, right? And so they would eat that chocolate cake and they'd be like, oh, the devil got me with temptation. And I'm always like, did the devil tempt you to eat all the frosting too? Was that the devil too? Right? Oftentimes we can shift blame away from ourselves and put it on somebody else or something else so that it kind of makes us feel better. Right? But if we ever want to be the version of ourselves that God has ordained us to be, then we need to know what it means to grow ourselves. To be able to challenge our own person to become greater. You see, are we able to clearly see what we need to do, or do we have our heads buried down in the sand like an ostrich? Do we just do what we're told to do? Or are we able to see ourselves in the mirror and apply the word of God in our lives? Are we able to hear the voice of God direct us in this life? So the title of this sermon this morning is called Lift Up Your Eyes. Lift Up Your Eyes. I got the inspiration from this, from this, for this message. Uh, one of my best friends at Awaken Church wrote a song called Lift Up Your Eyes. I recommend listening to it. It's a great worship song. And uh, lift up your eyes. You see, I'm all about hard work. But hard work is made perfect when you can clearly see where you're going and where you still need to go. See, hard work is totally awesome until we've worked super hard pushing this giant rock 100 yards out of the way only to realize we pushed it 100 yards in the wrong direction, right? And then all the hard work we had was literally a detriment to us because we couldn't see where it needed to go. You see, one of the main issues the modern church, uh, the modern day church faces is how we need to train people to grow themselves. The church is a place to be discipled, to encounter the presence of God, but growth is just as much a personal battle as it is the church's. I found that if, if I'm only growing on Sundays, if I'm only being discipled on Sundays, if I'm only being uh, growing and being better one-seventh of my week, then I shouldn't be surprised if I become one-seventh of the man that I want to be. Right? And if I'm, only, if I'm only in church not paying attention, then that's a whole other story. But it's crazy we have this phenomenon that we can oftentimes blame the devil or blame the church for not being enough when we ourselves aren't doing what it takes to see that growth come to pass. You see, I don't want to just be a one-seventh man, and I guarantee you my wife doesn't want a one-seventh man. When she said at the altar, she said, I ain't marrying you if you're one-seventh man. And I said, hey, that's not going to be the case. You see, because point number one, growth is everybody's journey. Point number one, growth is everybody's journey. In the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verse 52 we encounter one of the few verses of Jesus' young years. Uh, we get some of the only glimpses of Jesus as a child in this chapter. And it reads in uh, verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So this takes place uh, right after the famous story where Mary and Joseph took 12-year-old Jesus to Jerusalem for Passover and they forgot him. I mean, I can relate to Jesus here. I was often the kid that would get lost at the mall, half because my dad would leave me and half because I would wander off. It's, it's just the combo of having children, I guess. But I had to be honest, probably what Mary and Joseph went through when they lost Jesus might be the worst thing ever because they couldn't go to God for help. I mean, just imagine. Let you just imagine Joseph. He's like, oh, where's Jesus? I thought you had him. And he's like, oh, God, help. And God's like, yes. And he's like, God, please help me. I've lost Nobody. It's all good. <laughs> I, hey, I just, want, I just want to know, you're still working up there. Are we good? He's like, yes, we're good. Where's my son Jesus? I haven't seen him in a while. He's like, what's that, God? <laughs> Get a little fuzzy. I don't got Verizon. I got T-Mobile. So the call's breaking up. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Right? Like, could you imagine? You could not really go to God to tell him that you lost the Savior of the free world. You, you, you just couldn't. Right? You see, 
they ended up finding Jesus in the temple after searching for him for three days. And when they find him, they take him home. But if I'm being honest, the temple would have been the first place I would have looked uh, because whenever I was lost as a child, my dad knew where he would find me in the donut store. To this day, if I'm ever lost, Aubrey knows the first place she's going is Rainbow Donuts, right? But before they leave to go back home from Jerusalem, the young Jesus says something so powerful, so profound in Luke 2, 49. He says, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? You see, before Jesus was ever able to grow as a man in both wisdom and character, he had to make a decision to be about God's business. A couple weeks back, we had our Tribe Men's Forge Conference. Who is at Forge Conference? Oh, come on, somebody. It was off the chain. Uh, and I remember pa uh, Bishop Dale Bronner gave a word so profound, and one of the bits he was talking about was the word decision, we typically mean, we typically use to mean the making up of one's mind, right? I've decided to follow Jesus, I've made up my mind, but decision in its Latin roots is so much more powerful. Decision literally means to cut out every other thing other than what's most important. That when Jesus made a decision that the only thing worth pursuing in this life was the will of God. Jesus didn't say that he must be about the marketplace so I can make a lot of money and have a Lamborghini. Jesus didn't say I must use my popularity to get political favors for Israel. Jesus didn't say that I must spend this life living for pleasure. Jesus said that I must be in my father's house because there's nothing else in this world that can satisfy what I need. You see, once Jesus made a decision, he cut out all the other options, he, he wanted to pursue God's call, he was then able to grow and gain favor with both God and men. To be able to live a life pleasing to God in heaven and also thriving while on earth. You see, a lot of us have grown up in institutions that, that kind of taught that you can't enjoy life while being Christian. Right? The devil knows what he's doing. In most TV shows we watch, the lame person was the Christian. The boring person was the pastor. That was the imagery the devil was trying to place. You know, we were all kind of taught you couldn't make money and be fruitful in the house of God. That, that you can't spend your days in the house of God and expect to have fun. That's what was said to me when I was a child by my peers. But what I've learned is that is when I've grown in wisdom and stature with God, I found myself getting more favor with man on earth. You see, the principles of God aren't just to get us into heaven, but to get us to bring heaven while we're here on earth. There's a reason why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When I get saved, I don't get beamed up to heaven like it's Star Trek. There's a reason. Because when I got saved, when I got the heavenly download, it was to then bring heaven to this earth. But how could I do that if I wasn't allowing heaven to grow in me? How could I bring heaven to other people if I wasn't allowing myself to grow in heaven? You see, before we can ever develop, we can ever grow or ever be discipled, we have to decide so. We have to decide to no longer live with those vices we've kept in the back closet. To live with the bitterness or unforgiveness. To live with shame. Some of us in here carry shame with us to try to prove to God that we're, we love him and are sorry for past sins. You can't keep that with you when you want to grow. I see, I found that as I've grown spiritually, I've grown physically. That when I feed my spirit and enable my spirit to become great and strong, my outside world reflects that. You see, we were all born inside of our mother's wombs. We were all born, all made from the inside out because God wanted that to be a principle for how we live this life. Everything starts on the inside and then will trickle out to my outside. If you want a better outside you, well then how is the inside you? Come on, somebody. Y'all awake. Y'all awake at the 11. I like it. Come on. I love the 9 a.m. because they get up early so they can have church and watch football. I respect that. But hey, they, they, aren't, they aren't one as good looking as y'all and two just, just as loud. Some of y'all go to both services and you're like, I'm partially offended. No. It's good. It's good to be here. You see, Jesus was fully man and fully God. Jesus had a free will like you and me. I guarantee you Jesus, when he was 20, would go home from temple, from Sundays after the temple, you know, and he would get in his boxers. He'd want to watch the Padres find a new way to lose. They're best. They're incredible at it. Find a new way to make me sad, right? See, Jesus wasn't given a cheat code in life by being God. Jesus literally forsook his divinity to become human like us. You see, Jesus had to grow in life. Growth is everybody's journey. Even Jesus had to grow. A big tip I told all my youth students was, if Jesus did it, probably means you're going to have to do it too. That's just the golden standard. If Jesus made a decision to grow, then that clearly is an indication 
Well, then that's on me now, too. I have to. You see, before Jesus could ever be our Savior, he had to grow in both wisdom to combat the devil's schemes and character in order to live the sinless life as the Lamb of God. But then how do we grow? That's a common question. We aren't living in Jesus' day where we can get baptized and wander the desert for 40 years. You know, I've got bills to pay. I've got burritos I want to eat, right? See, the easiest way to start growing is identifying the areas of growth in our life. If you've been coming here for a long time and you're like, man, what's the next step for me? Have you gone through our next steps class? Have you wanted to figure out how you can start serving this community, bringing heaven to earth, finding a ministry group, whether it's the youth, uh, the marriage class, etc., finding a way you can pour yourself out? Are some of us in here just desperate to learn how to hear God's word better? Desperate to learn how to grow in God's word? Well, are you willing to read his Bible? I one of my good friends, uh, Duncan, he, he's been coming to the church for about a year, and he texts me recently saying, you always talk about how you have this one-year Bible. Could you please send it to me because I want to further that whole thing. That's growth right there. For some of us, it's will we start giving? Will we start tithing? Will we really show God that he has our whole heart? One of the most profound verses in all of Scripture is where Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters. You will love one and despise the other, or you will despise one and love the other. You cannot serve both God, and he doesn't say the devil. My natural thought is he would say, you can't serve both God and the devil. You can't serve good and evil. That just makes sense. He didn't say you can't serve both God and popularity. He didn't say you can't serve both God and yourself. He didn't say you can't serve both God and Buddha. What Jesus says is you cannot serve both God and money. And the easiest way to know if you serve money is when the offering message comes on, do you hold your wallet tighter? Does it say, I can't let this go? If you can't let money go, you don't have money, money has you. The easiest way, oh, come on, somebody, come on, somebody. The easiest way to know money don't have a say over my life is can you give it away? You see, and, and some of us in this place, we're, we're trying to finally shed some of these sins that we keep stumbling back into. Are we in a small group? Do we have people around us? Do we believe in James 5, 16 that says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other so that you might be healed. I'm in a, we have a softball league at this church that I'm in, and we have a group chat, and we pray for each other about things. We celebrate with each other about victories. I'm a pastor, but I still have a pastor. Pastors have pastors too. We all need people in this life that we can go to for prayer and for healing because we all still need to grow. Can I get an amen this morning? You see, Matthew 7, verses 18 through 19 reads, A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus, that just doesn't sound very grace-filled. <laughs> Where's the grace, Jesus? Come on. See, the easiest way to know you are producing fruit is are you still alive and growing in your faith? You see, dead trees produce no fruit. It's the moment we're spiritually dead, the moment that we decide to no longer pursue God that we risk losing everything. It's true, it went, it's funny because pirates have gotten this right. Pirates say dead men tell no tales. That once you've died, everything kind of stops afterwards. Yet we as the church are kind of slow on the eight ball. Once we've decided to stop growing spiritually, well then can we still produce fruit? You see, it's my job as a minister, it's our job as a church to see people be set up for success in growth. But then at some point, it becomes, as, it becomes us as individuals who need to decide ourselves to grow. You see, as we grow, we won't need to live in the fear of failure, but with the joy and the prospect of victory. So point number two this morning, point number two, for those taking notes, is don't be afraid of the giants. Point number two, don't be afraid of the giants. Oftentimes, the greatest uh, inhibitor or, or stoppage we have to our growth is, is how daunting it might seem, right? That some of us can, we can really see the areas we need to grow in, and, and it's not that we don't see it, but we just think it's too big to be moved. We aren't at the age we can do it anymore. This, this issue, this sin has just always been around. I don't know how to do it. It just can't happen. You know, some of us, we see that we need to go to the gym, but waking up early, that ain't going to happen. Right, we see that we need to diet, but then again, a Chick-fil-A just opened up next door, right? And for some of us in here, we see that we need to learn to refine the love that we had for our spouse, but the memories and the bitterness just keep flooding back to our minds, and we think, how do I get rid of this? You see, the devil knows that there's no greater way to keep us in bondage, keep us standing skilled, than to paralyze us with fear than to constantly remind us of how daunting and insurmountable this challenge seems. And I'm immediately reminded of a story in our Bible. It's amazing. The Bible's got answers to everything. I'm immediately reminded of a story in 1 Samuel 17 about David and Goliath. 
See, most of us have probably heard this story, right, where this tiny little pipsqueak shepherd boy takes on this gigantic man of war, right, whose spear, the Bible says, the shaft of his spear was the size of a weaver's beam. I don't know what a weaver's beam looks like, but my goodness, does that sound impressive. <laughs> it's like, just imagine me, the people at the battlefield, right? They're like, oh my gosh, that guy's huge, isn't he? That guy's enormous, mate. His sword is huge. And the guy's like, no, it's not a sword. It's a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam? Is that even legal? I thought those were outlawed in the Geneva Convention. I know, all I got is this little thing right here, like maybe two feet long. He's got, he's got a bloody weaver's beam. It's not fair. We don't have a chance. I just love the details in the Bible. Not only are there weaver's beam, but there are British people too. When you really look hard enough, God just has a heart for the British. It's funny. So this giant warrior, this man mountain, this obstacle literally stood between Israel and the freedom they wanted from the Philistines. They could not grow until they took out this literally giant problem. In 1 Samuel 17, 16 reads, For 40 days the Philistine, Goliath, came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. You kind of read through this and you're all like, okay, Goliath would come out morning and evening. He came out morning and evening. You see, it's a picture that the enemy always seeks to be the first voice that you hear when you wake up and the last that you hear when you go to bed so that every thought in between he can have authority over. You see, the devil knows that the battle first starts in the mind. If he can win the battle in the mind, then he can't ever lose. That's why, and it's a very sad, there's always a sad correlation between mental unrest and suicide. That if he can win the battle in the mind, then the fight in the outside world never even seems possible. You see, Goliath came out and says every morning, give us a man that we might fight. And now he wasn't listening to Abba. He didn't, he didn't listen to Mama Mia. He wasn't saying, give me, give me, give me a man after midnight, right? He, he, wasn't, he wasn't that type of giant, right? He was saying, give me a man that he might fight. He was trying to paralyze people with fear. Every morning and evening for 40 days. 40 in the Bible is the number for a generation or a complete cycle. So an entire generation of men paralyzed with fear, and they stayed fearful until someone decided to no longer be afraid because of what was in front of him, because he had somebody behind him, and his name is the living God. Can I get an amen this morning? You see, when Goliath sees David, he's insulted since he's so tiny. He says, are you a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Bible says that David, or that Goliath cursed David by his false gods. When David sees Goliath, he doesn't put his head down in shame. He doesn't become intimidated. He doesn't say, oh God, you're right. <laughs> what if I, I made a horrible mistake. You've got a spear with a shaft the size of a weaver's beam. How can I compete with this? He doesn't do that. The Bible says that David lifts up his eyes to God. And then he looks at the giant in his eyes and he says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. What's interesting here is that all David had on him was a sling and a stone. Home dog didn't have armor, let alone a sword. But yet he claimed that he would take off the head of a giant. See, when you lift up your eyes to God, he enables you to see the victory before he even reveals how. He will show you the promise before he even reveals the tools. That's the God that we serve. You see, David was able to take out the giant because God was with him. David first lifted up his eyes to God. He didn't look at the problem. He looked to the solution. You see, after he lifted up his eyes to God, he was then able to look at the giant with full assurance and say, my God has never lost a battle, and he doesn't plan to have his first loss with me. Your days are numbered. You see, when David lifted up his eyes, God showed him the very sword being used against him, and he would use that sword to see the victory. You see, some of us in this life have had a sword used to cut off family members by depression. But that same sword that the devil used to cut off these family members will be that same sword that you set them free from when you use the word of God to sing a praise to God through a hard time. You see, the devil has a sword on this generation that is trying to infest them with lust, infest them with, with eyes that don't have a heart for God. And, you know, their parents might have had a moral failing and their parents might have had a 
marriage that splits up. But the sword the devil used on this generation will be the same sword that they used to set the same people free. You see, the devil has a sword, and that sword is named alcohol, and it's got your brother and sister ensnared. But the same sword that the devil used will be the same sword we use by the blood of Jesus when we take communion and say there is no vice, there is no power, there is no authority that can ever take any claim over my family. Can I get an amen this morning? You see, God will show you the victory before he ever shows you how. And sometimes that how will take you the enemy's sword. It's all in the Bible. It's crazy. I love this book. It's incredible. You see, the power of the church is to get us to learn to see the weapons God has given us. Even if the weapon might be in the enemy's hand today, the word of God is spoken and doesn't return void. We will see that very weapon not prosper against us, but will be used by us. Some of us just need to see the authority we have. I'm reminded of a story that happened a few months ago, maybe a few weeks ago, a time ago. With me and my wife, we were driving home after youth. It was about 9, 30, 10. And, you know, because we stay, we, we tear down the service and we have all the kids and we go home and it's, it's a good time. And we're driving and, and a student had called Aubrey and I. And I was thinking, I mean, look, I was like, I'm, she's probably going to say, what a great service tonight. You guys did awesome. Pastor Robbie, you look beautiful. The standard thing, right? But so she called and she was really frantic. And, and she, she was like, I'm not saying this in a negative way, but she was like hysterically trying to talk to us about something that happened to her dad recently, that her dad had to be rushed to the hospital because he was experiencing horrible issues with his blood and his heart. And his brother, uh, her brother had to drive him there, but because he didn't have his license, he was stranded at the hospital, couldn't get home because the dad was being operated on. So the mom had to go pick him up and leave the daughter at home, the other daughter, the youngest daughter. And the youngest daughter was really afraid. And so that caused the older sister to become afraid over the whole situation. And she She's crying, and she says, could you please pray for me? And immediately I wanted to respond by saying, yes, of course we can. But the Holy Spirit said, Ash, this is the moment that you need to teach this student about why we really have church. That we don't have church. We don't sit in these seats to hear lectures. We sit in these seats to understand that there's a God that we serve that is alive and he's active. That she is just as able to set her father free, to release her sister from that fear as I am. That she too has the power because it's the same spirit on this stage, is the same one in those seats. And in that moment I said, sweetheart, you best believe I'm going to pray for you. But did you know that you too have the authority that with one word you can send something to go and something to come. You have that power because of the God you serve. We have church not as just a ritual obligation, but we have church to get filled with the power of the living God. Oh, come on, somebody. And it was so beautiful in that moment. You know, she was still crying, and she's one of those girls who cries like, <laughs> she was like, you're so right. Thank you. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, I prayed for her. I texted her the next day, how did it go? She said, really good. They got it all sorted out. Thank you. And that's going to be a moment that she can look back on in the future and say, God, you didn't lose that battle. You're not going to start your first loss with me. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> point number three. If I could have the keys come up, point number three. Point number three is titled, Change Your Vision. And this is where it gets good. This is where it gets good. I'm having fun. You guys having fun this morning? Oh, come on. Point number three is change your vision. Uh, uh, one of the saddest stories we ever hear about is people who, who die in avalanches. Uh, it's a healthy fear of mine. Whenever I go skiing, I always size up the mountain, how much snow is on here. Where's the nearest amount of large noise that could set this thing off? How fast would I have to ski to make it down? Who do I have to push to survive, right? That's how a man works. That's how we operate. But one of the saddest, you know, causes of death is, is, is being, you know, covered by an avalanche and suffocation. But the real saddest part to me when I, when I was reading about this was they'll release the rescue dogs to go and get the sand to try and dig them out. And they kept on finding that rescue dogs were going and digging in the sand and they would find where the people were buried. But they found that instead of trying to dig up to freedom, these people dug further and further down to their death. Because in the avalanche, they were flipped upside down. And in their vision, up was down and down was up. So rather than working hard to escape to new life, they worked harder to ensure their own demise. It's the saddest story because it's true that it's not how hard you work, but it's where is your vision. You can work as hard as you want, but if it's in the wrong direction, it's not going to help you in life. You see, it's not just enough to have an ambition to grow, to have a desire to grow. You also need to have a vision where you want to grow. 
In Genesis chapter 15, verses 4 through 5, it reads, And the word of the Lord came to him, him being Abraham. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham was taken outside by God and told to lift up his eyes and see the promise of God. You see, before God could ever change what was inside Sarah's womb, he had to change Abraham's vision. Before anything could be birthed in Abraham's life, Abraham first had to have his vision changed. You see, so often does God call us outside, out of our normal routine, out of our normal thinking, our normal way of life, and he calls us to go see something new in order for us to receive something new. There's a power of being able to lift up our eyes and no longer looking at what's right in front of you, but being able to see beyond that to where God is. When you can see the invisible God, you can see miracles. When you can see the invisible, you can achieve the impossible. Those in history who can see the invisible have always been the ones to achieve the impossible. I'm reminded of a story of a man who, who was a man who dropped out of high school after his freshman year. And he wanted to start a business and he was looking for land to buy and he noticed there was land for sale in California in the in the Orange County Anaheim area but everybody had called this the swamp of the sea unsellable land people had owned it for generations and nobody wanted to buy it, it was unsellable in fact when this man came to buy the land everybody said why would you do this the debt's just now gonna be on you the person was so quick to wipe his hands free of this land this man bought, I believe it's 2,700 acres or 27,000 acres for a total of $859,000 in 1950. That land in Orange, uh, California is now called Disneyland. And what was at one point in time deemed the most worthless land in the world is now literally the most expensive property in the world. You see, because one man, his name was Walt Disney, when everybody else saw an empty land that nobody could be on, he looked past that, looked up to his God, saw the invisible land, but he saw the impossible future that he could achieve. You see, those who can see the invisible can achieve the impossible. When everybody else, all they could see was barren land. But he could see it, the structures, the happy faces, the miracles, the people wanting to come here year after year. He could see that in the future. And that story is also kind of repeated in a way. It's either 1971 or 1969 when Walt Disney World in Florida was first opened. And I believe Walt Disney at this point in time had passed due to tuberculosis. And so his brother... Uh, ended up running Disney Corporation, and his wife was there for the unveiling, right, to cut the giant ribbon and open up Disney World. And Walt Disney's brother looked at Walt Disney's late wife and said, isn't it such a shame that Walt isn't here to see this? This was his vision. He would have loved to have seen this. And I love Walt Disney's wife because she looked at the brother right there and says, in fact, did you know that he actually did see it? Every single day of his life when he woke up, this was the only thing he could ever see was this day once being open. There's no surprise that we're standing here today because one man had the vision all of those years ago. You see, those who can see the invisible can achieve the impossible. Uh, Helen Keller, the famous author who's blind and deaf, she said the only thing worse than being born blind was being born able to see yet not having any vision. That we have the ability to grow yet we don't see how. You see, before Disney was ever born into this world, the vision of one man changed. Before anything was born into the life of Abraham, his vision had to change. God had to take him outside and tell him to lift up his eyes. The whole time of Abraham's life, Abraham means exalted father. But yet he had no children. You go to Starbucks. What's the name for the coffee? Abraham. Oh, you got a lot of kids. No. Are they, you're old? Are they old and they move out of the house? No. Oh, did they die at a young age? No, I've actually never had kids. Like, but your name's Exalted Father. Abraham lived his whole life in a constant reminder of what he was not, of what he wasn't able to do. And what I love about our God is he took Abraham outside and he told him to lift up his eyes. And it's so powerful when, 
when God was speaking to Abraham, all he said was lift up your eyes. But what he was really saying is, Abraham, I need you to stop looking at and seeing what the world has told you you are. I need you to stop seeing your past. Stop seeing your failures. Stop seeing your limitations. Stop seeing the ways you've been held back. Stop seeing the sins that you once committed. I need you to stop seeing all that. I need you to lift up your eyes. I need you to see the future that I have for you. You see, somebody in this house this morning needs to learn what it means to lift up their eyes and see Abraham's whole life had been spent right in front of him going to church giving offerings being with God but his whole life changed when he decided to finally look up and see the presence of God you see nothing in your life can grow until you're able to see what God sees do you see your life the way God sees your life just as how God saw an old man past childbearing years become a father. Just as he saw a man who left high school after one year, Walt Disney, create one of the world's largest corporations. Once we lift up our eyes and see God, the impossible future we dreamed of will become our reality. But before we can do that, you have to lift up your eyes to him. I can't be the only one who loves the Arizona sunsets. They're very beautiful, a very picturesque moment. Um, when I grew up in San Diego, I had beach sunsets, and those are really nice. But when I go outside late at night, and I'll see the hues of purple and blue and yellow and pink. And I'm just immediately reminded of how good our God is. And it's in those moments where I can hear God speak to me so clearly. Do you remember, he, he tell me, do you remember those times in your past where you, you struggled and you wondered where I was? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, and he shows me. And then he says, do you remember all those arguments you had with Aubrey? And I said, yeah. He's like, do you now see why you were wrong? And I was like, you know what, now I do. <laughs> but I would never see these things. I'm being dead serious. I'm, I love my wife, and I love her because she's like a firecracker of a woman. She's incredible. She's, she's awesome. But I'm also a little bit, yeah, give it up for my wife really quick. I'll, I'll take that. She's incredible. But I'm also German, which means I can be arrogant and stubborn. I mean, history has taught us anything, right? And literally, in those moments, you know, I'll come to God and be like, God, can you believe what Aubrey said and did and all this other stuff? And again, because I lift up my eyes and talk to him, he just walks me through. He says, you didn't know what she was doing behind the scenes, but you're saying as if you did. You didn't know what she says when no one's looking about your character, but yet you're saying all this to her in her front. You see, I would never, I would never come to my own uh, intuition to think that way if I wasn't able to lift up my eyes to God. See, there's something so powerful, something new that gets born in us when we lift up our eyes. You see, as we lift up our eyes and see God, we need to chase after him. Are we, are we studying his word? Are we inviting people into our house for fellowship? Are, are we signing up for next steps in serving? You see, I'll never forget one of the most common questions I would get as a youth pastor was, how, how do I know when it's God's word and when it's my word? Because sometimes I feel like it's God, but then it doesn't happen and God's word doesn't turn wood. So what's going on? I would always say, how often have you read your Bible? And they'd say, well, not often. And I'd say, well, how do you ever expect to hear someone's word if you don't know it? Somebody could be giving me the best advice, the best wisdom, but if it's in French and I don't know French, what can I do with it? But yet some of us in here are in the same question. I can't hear God. But are willing to chase after him and do what it takes to hear God. You see, do we have the hunger to grow? The desire to be discipled? If there's no hunger, then that is usually the first sign someone is dying. The sad part is that there are some spiritually dead people in this world who come to church every Sunday. There are some spiritually dead people who go to midweek from time to time. There are some spiritually dead people who have served in COC before, maybe even active. There are some spiritually dead people who have once given in an offering and tithe. But they're spiritually dead because they decided they didn't need to grow in their relationship with God. And they run the risk of entering into heaven and saying, Jesus, did I not do all these signs in your name? But he looks at that person and says, depart from me because I did not know you because they made a decision that they didn't want to grow and they were thrown into the furnace. If I could please have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes this morning. Bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. As, I, as I've been talking this morning, some of you in these seats are like, Pastor Ash, you, you've spoken to me. I never really realized what I was living with. 
I never realized that it was easy to allow things to usurp God's place as my number one. And maybe some of you in here have never actually really invited Jesus to be your savior of your life and enter into paradise with him. So my first appeal this morning is with every head bowed and every eye closed, if for the first time and the first time in a long time, we never want to have a church service where we don't extend this invitation, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would like to invite Jesus in, and let me pray for you, just on the count of three, lift up your hands so I can pray for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, ready? One, two, three, lift up hands in this place. Lift up hands, wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you at the back. Thank you right there, thank you right there, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see those hands up the back. Thank you, thank you. You can put those down. And now the second appeal this morning is for those of us who know God, which is very good. Even the demons know God and they tremble. But do we grow in God? Is that's what's inside of us, growing us. And maybe some of you in here are, are, have a healthy understanding that there could come a time where we sat all this time in church where we can enter heaven and God says, but I didn't really know you. And you're saying, Pastor Ash, I want to receive that Holy Spirit. I want to receive that power and authority to be able to do what he needs me to do and grow how I must go. If that's you this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, so I can pray for you, would you just lift up your hand right now and say, I want to make a decision to grow in my faith. Lift up your hand in this place. Lift up your hand in this place. Man, hands are going up all over this place. Hands are going up. It's never too late to start your growth with God. Man, right now, everybody just come into agreement with me. I'm going to pray over those. Holy Spirit, I pray that you've seen the people who have lifted up their hands to want to chase after you, to want to grow in you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will descend upon these people and fill them right now. Allow them to hear you like they've never heard you before and move in you like they've never walked before. In Jesus' name, God, I pray right now, give them the authority and give them the vision to grow how they must grow and to do what they must do to bring heaven into this earth. And Holy Spirit, right now, for all of those who lifted up their hands to invite you into their hearts. God, please have everybody repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, everybody repeat it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, today, I choose to love you. I choose to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. Let's give the Lord a big shout of praise in this house. Oh, come on. Man, I love church. I do. I love it. It's so much fun. Uh, one of my favorite things I learned recently was that the song made in the 70s by that one disco group like, celebrate good times, come on. That came from the scripture where it says, Jesus says, angels celebrate whenever somebody gets saved. I'm like, how far has the music industry come? We need to go back to those roots. Can I get a last amen this morning? Ah, uh, come on. You guys have been wonderful. Please, would you give it up for Pastor Brad?